Shalom, it's Mariah Aliza with Mariah Shalee Village and today I am shooting this video to share or to give you um, a writing and rhetoric review. So we've been using writing, writing and rhetoric for a few years now. It's my favorite program. It's not that popularly known, but I tend to be that homeschooler where the majority of what I use isn't popularly known amongst other homeschoolers. And I'm okay with that. Um, but I wanted to, now that I have, you see the stack of books here? Now that I have so many of them and I've seen my son progress throughout the um, books here and just really, really increase the skills in writing I wanted to share. I'm not a major um, reviews person on my channel, so I don't know, this might be the first and then you might not see one for a very while, for a very long time. Um, but the first book, well first let me start with this. Writing and Rhetoric um, follows the classical approach, which I do um, fancy. And it has 12 books in their complete program. And so book one is Fable. And they recommend starting it somewhere between grades three and four. I can't find a thing that I disagree with. The approach, the writing, um, the sequence, the style, the stories, the multiculturalism that's in it. The only thing that I would say is I would probably back up a year from how they have it. So like where it says book one is three to four, um, we started in grade four. I probably wouldn't have done this in grade three. And then so I look like I'm behind um, in a set of books as you hear me talk about it. And then the other thing that you need to know is that two books are in a year. So book one and book two would be one year. Book three and book four, another. Five and six, another. Seven and eight, another. Nine and ten, and then finally the child ends in books 11 and 12, and that would be one year as well. So it takes six years to get through the entire program if you're starting at book one. So and with their recommendation, if you're starting in um, grade three, then you'd be done um, by the time the child became a freshman. So we are going to be done in freshman year. So the freshman year will be our last year just because of the way that I sequenced it. Okay, so writing and rhetoric, book one, fable, looks like this. And so in this book, basically they were exposed to different fables. And so they had to write in that style. It's narrative writing. And so a lot of it was fable-esque if you will. And so we've com we've completed the entire um, book. And so at the end, what he needed to do was the story he read was the ants and the grasshopper, I believe. Yes. And so it takes them through a series of writing skills, which I love. They read the story and then they have a narration or tell it back and we have a talk about it, which is where we really have a lot of our in-depth conversation and I get to hear his mind and his heart about certain issues, character, um, decisions, choices, what type of person are you going to be, all of that. That's why I love literature so much um, and language arts in general. And then they have a go deeper, which I like, a lot of critical thinking skills. Then he has writing time, which in the very first one shows up as copy work, dictation. Um, we don't always do dictation, but I I do it enough to count, but I don't do it like every single story. Uh, sentence play, which I love. I love giving him different sentence structure and sentence varieties. That's what I struggle with the most out of my high schoolers when I'm teaching them. All their sentences sound the same. So I love that they introduce this um, as early as grade three, four. And then they have copiousness and um, sometimes a rewrite. So the ants and the grasshopper and what he needed to do was, let's see what the instructions say. Oh, he had to, oh, they were doing point of view. That's right, I remember this. Um, he ended up switching up the point of view for one of the assignments that he had to do. So I'll read you his narrative so you can kind of hear what he was able to do at the end of book one. Um, one bright day in late autumn, a group of ants were bustling about in the sunshine, collecting grain one by one, singing and carrying grain, um, while a hungry grasshopper played his fiddle and said to the ants, may I have a piece? The ants started at, 
the aunt stared, excuse me, at him. Then the aunt replied, while we heard you making sweet music, we worked. So now it's your time. The ants turned their heads and swooshed their bodies in the opposite direction. Before the grasshopper could speak, the ant said, you should be ashamed of yourself. And the ant said to each other, I wouldn't even dare to ask that question if I was that lousy grasshopper. So compared to where he started in the beginning of this book, and I realize I didn't read that to you, um, it was amazing. Um, let's see. And I won't. I don't want this video to be long, so I won't. But he was able to put all of those ideas together. He had dialogue. Um, he had characters. There was some resemblance of a plot. And it definitely um, gave some um, familiarity to the story he'd been asked to model, which was the grass and the, the grass. Sorry, the ants and the grasshopper. Excuse me. Um, and... He had interesting like vocabulary, like swooshed in and um, other things that he said that I'm forgetting right now. Oh, the autumn, you know, a late autumn day and all those things. So I was very impressed after book one, I'll tell you. So I was very excited to start book two, which we did in the second part of fourth grade. So first semester, second semester is kind of the thing there. Um, and in this one, it's um narrative one so he he read different types of narratives so let me give you an example um he did a long parable the prodigal son a short parable the rich fool and then he did a greek myth um another parable and in this one he learned how to add description and i believe dialogue and then they focused on the conflict or the middle of the story so I'll read, I believe, his last one. Yes. Um, what was he asked to do? Oh, I remember this story. It was about Samba. It was an African tale, which we really appreciated. I love the multiculturalism in this program, I'll be honest. Um, but he read about Samba and the Coward. It was It's adapted from an African tale by Andrew Lang. And... Again, he's modeling. So his story, and in this one, he had to do a little, a little um, rewriting. As soon as the king heard about this deed, he set foot to chase Samba. Oh, I remember. So he read the story. Sorry, I'm backtracking. He read the story, and then he had to pick up where the story left off. As soon as the king heard about his deed, he set foot to chase Samba. He had been gone from the village for 70 days, and the tribe of robbers had returned. They made Samba their slave. He had to make dens, wells, and grow a garden on 3.1 acres of land. Finally, the king caught up with Samba, his soldiers killed the robbers, giving Samba enough time to escape to Ethiopia. The king was exiled from Ethiopia. Uh oh, and to enter would would make war. As Samba entered, the king of Ethiopia chose him to be the second in command, escaping the robbers. Then Samba smote the Ethiopian king and conquered him. And conquered him and surrendered it to his father, the king, right? So I remember writing, I wrote a note here saying, this is a very good middle or the plot to your story. You're ready to move on to book three because the program has um, like a little rubric you can follow for each book that you have. And so I don't really expect them to do amazing on the first few stories, but towards the middle of the book, I'm like, you should be looking better than the first and towards the end, you should look like you have the skills ready to move on to the next book because I'm looking ahead at the rubric for the next one, making sure he can keep up. And he did. So he worked very well in book three, which was narrative two. And so it looks like this. Oh, I'm not sure if I showed you book two. Book two, writing and rhetoric, narrative one. And then book three, writing and rhetoric, narrative two. So this was an extension of the other one. And so in this one, we reviewed narrative types, which was really good for him to learn different types of narratives. And so in his um, literature class, I was also mirroring with some of those titles so he could recognize them while he was reading his novels. Um, so I think they still do fables in this one. Yeah, he had fables and he's learning how to outline in this one and how to like begin a story. He learned about protagonists versus antagonists and then let's see historical narrative 
And then there was another one. Oh, the five W's. He learned the five W's and like the making of a legend, which is another type of narrative. So he did a very good job in this one as well. Um, he wrote really, really, really well. I'll read you one in the beginning for this one. So one of the things that he add, they add in this, I don't know if it's in this one or in the one before, but amplification. So they go through like summary, condense that story, and then um, amplify, you know, give it more volume, give it more depth. So in this one, let's see, I think he read Jack the Giant Killer. Yes, and so then he had to write his own story, which was really, really good. Um, the giant awoke, but he did not see Jack. So he went back to sleep in his big bushy bed. Jack had climbed out of the window when the giant awoke. He recognized that his shabby golden club was missing. He slipped on his furry little flippers and went outside of his tent-like house made of pine straw and wood. Jack was right by the door. He climbed up the slippery doorknob and started yelling, Hey giant, if you want your club back, promise you won't try to kill me. The giant agreed, but Jack knew that once he got the club back, he would start killing. Jack went back to his lodge. He was going to the giant's motel. There were good giants and bad giants. Jack still didn't understand why good giants couldn't kill bad giants. So he guessed it was because they were all giants. Jack had an idea. The sun was changing colors as it slowly sloped down the edge of the earth. The stars were glamorous and he couldn't wait to use his idea. He Oh, I made a note. <laughs> he said he got some. Um, and I was like, you've got to change that. I don't think he ever did. Um, he got some friends over to build a catapult. It took 10 hours. Once they were done, he crept into the giant's room. The tall brown door creaked as they entered the room. They moved the golden club onto the catapult and aimed it at the giant's face. They jumped on the lever and shot it right in his head. He gave me the little... I don't mind a peer for that. Um, so that was the very beginning. So we're coming right off of the last book. And I I think some of my notes were love the quotes for dialogue because he struggled with that in the other book and it really stressed it. So I'm glad they fixed that in his writing. Um, I put that I love the imagery, the imagination and creativity is good. Watch out for run-on sentences, which his writing struggles with write on, run on sentences at this point, and they actually fixed that in another book, which I love. Yay, writing and rhetoric. And then I also put, you are abusing the pronoun they, you need variety. So, um, which for the most part has been fixed in his writing too. So that's what it started at the beginning. And then towards the end, so let's see if I can get a really quick one. Um... Let's see, he was asked to write a dialogue to show what might have been said between George and the king after George rescued the town. Remember that dialogue is a conversation between two or more people. And so they, they worked on a lot of dialogue, which I love because it really helped him to develop his ideas and to consider characterization. And it just helped his writing to deepen. And then he finally got to add those quotation marks when you are um, writing dialogue. I, I won't read all of this, but I will show you. Um, so his story starts here underneath the amplification, and then he went up until here. You can see there's pictures and things to break it up. And here, so I was very surprised with the length and the depth of what he was able to do after he finished narrative two. So now um, the narration is done out of those three books. And at that point in three books, he could write stories very well. His imagination and creativity was really good. He had some sense of characterization. He still needed some plot development. I mean, he had like a beginning, middle and an end, but um, it wasn't the most interesting, you know, beginning, middle, and end, but he could do it. And so I was very pleased with that. And I'm like, oh, wow, those are three books in. Let's, um, 
that'll have been a third way through because there's 12 books. So I was happy when I saw a third of the way into the program. So after that, we took a semester break um, because he started to get all kind of ideas writing his own book. So he started writing several short stories and poems and books because he was just so flooded with imagination and creativity. He just could not condense it into another uh, like curricula. So I let him take a semester off and just write, 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 and he enjoyed that. And so after that semester, we came back and we um, began with book four. And book four is Kreia and Proverb. And I thoroughly enjoyed this particular um, book as well. So we learned what in the world is Kreia. And that was really fun to learn about. We learned about literal and figurative language in Proverbs. Um, he began like creating a paragraph and understanding what topic sentences were. And this, these were the particular um, Kreia. Uh, there was the first Kreia was King Solomon, the second one was King Arthur, the third one was King Alfred the Great, the fourth one was um, King, I believe you say Canute, and he didn't want to read that one and I okayed it. The fifth one was two medieval poets, he didn't want to read that one either and I okayed it. And then um, the sixth Kreia was Francis of Assisi, the seventh Kreia was Queen Elizabeth I. The eighth was Lady Godiva, and the ninth was King Richard III. So we got um, a lot of culture with this one. Um, and of course, we love King Solomon. So when that was the first Kreia, we were very, very excited. So pretty much um, the idea with this one is still the same thing. Narration, go deeper with the critical thinking, writing time, dictation, sentence play, copiousness. Um, and then he started writing paragraphs. Um, but before he started writing paragraphs, they had him dividing um, the different paragraphs in a piece. So this is one of those assignments. They had a con an entire piece or an entire narrative, and then he had to divide where he thought the thought stopped at. This was an excellent exercise. And he ended up doing that for every single one. So by the time he got done, his organization and his order and even his flow to his writing was better just from doing these types um, of exercises. So we really enjoyed um, this one. This one stretched him the most because it asked for paragraph after paragraph and it kind of ordered it for him. So I'll give you an example. Like I think this one was Lady Godiva. So he read a story about Lady Godiva. He did all of that writing, narration, sentence play, copiousness, etc. And then he has to write his own crea. So paragraph one, you praise Lady Godiva or whoever it was. We did this pretty much systematically. Praise Lady Godiva for her concern for the poor and her willingness to take action. Paragraph two, why was Lady Godiva's action useful? Give details to support your answer. Um, paragraph three, introduce the contrast. And they don't tell him what to do. They just, they don't tell him how to do it. They just tell him that he needs to do, he needs to include a contrast, excuse me. Um, then they give him a little advice or a little, you know, nudge here. Think of an example of someone in history in a story or in a story who used their power to be greedy. So it's contrasting her helping the poor. And then give your example in the form of a very short narrative of story, which he did beautifully because he had three books of writing narratives. Paragraph four, introduce a comparison, which was great. And then last in paragraph five, conclude with the brief epilogue. And he did really, really well um, with that. He started to ask, could he type? So after he did a rough draft in the book, I let him um, type them up. So I don't even have it in here to read one to you. And now we are getting ready to pick up with books five and six for the 2018-2019 school year. And so, of course, these have not been done, but I'll show you what they look like. The books come like this. And then I take them and get the spines cut and have it look like this because it's better for him to write in when he can fold it back and not have the book like with this one. Let me show you why I don't like this. Because he's sitting like this and then the book folds back and folds back and it keeps closing on him and he doesn't like it. And I don't like it either. So this one, Refutation and Confirmation, will be doing um, for book five. And the first part of grade seven, and then we'll be doing commonplace book six, the second part of grade seven. I will wait until I shoot my language arts videos to go into these because these have not 
been done yet. This is what we're going to use for 1819. But I wanted to do um, a video going through the ones that we've already gone through so that you can understand why I'm still using this. Um, in grade seven, we'll probably continue to use it. I'll give him a semester off if he needs it because um, some of the books, not all of them, but like certain books, they, um, the style is very um, repetitive. And writing needs to be repetitive, like that's just what it is. But if the, if the book had the same repetition back to back, then I give him a break in between so he can kind of break that up. And so, and I'm okay with that. Um, okay, that was my review, writing and rhetoric. I love it. His critical thinking skills are amazing. His creativity, his imagination are amazing. And now he can write dialogue. His plot did develop. Um, I know I didn't read you one out of book four, but it did develop more. I mean, obviously, it can always be more developed. But I'm happy with his ability to write a narrative, whether it's a historical narrative. He can do legends, myths, um biographies he does a very good job writing that and he doesn't need a lot of prompts or prodding or pulling um if he he can just write from scratch um at this point but if he has something like write a biography on this person after reading about his life or after knowing something about him he does a very good job and so i am excited with that moving on into the next one we're going to leave narrative writing and go into persuasive writing so in maybe three books later i'll be able to show you how well his per persuasive writing has increased and developed over time. I hope this video was helpful to you. Um, writing and Rhetoric is written by or the company that publishes it is Classical Academic Press. That's where I buy my curriculum from. It's also available on christianbook.com. So just, you know, choose your fancy. Um, I was not paid to uh, do this video or asked to. I just wanted to share because a lot of people ask me what do I do for writing. And when I say writing and rhetoric, they say, I've never heard of that before. I'm not a big reviews person. Again, you probably won't see a lot of that on my channel. I want to reiterate that. But to help have an answer um, when people ask me what am I using and why, I want it to be able to supply you with that. Okay, if this video has been helpful for you, please like, share, subscribe. Until next time, shalom.